Sally and I are joined by Aaron Spike from New Ulm, Minnesota as well. And we're going to talk about web accessibility and ask the question, how accessible is your website? So webmasters, you're going to want to stay tuned. We're going to define what it is. We're going to give you tools to measure it on your own website and advice on how to improve it. All that and more coming up next. This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Hello, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs back with Wells Tech one more time. This is the 312th time exactly, Tuesday, October 22nd, 2013. Show where we talk about technology, ministry, and where those two intersect. We have tips this week, picks, and um, a special guest. Before we get to that person, let's introduce my normal co host, Sally Draper. Hi, Sally. Good morning, Martin. Happy to be joining you this morning from Wells Tech Capital West, New Ulm, Minnesota. It's a happening place. And I'm going to add uh, credence to that declaration by introducing our guest host, Aaron Spike, who's also here. Yeah, you have me outnumbered. New Ulm to Milwaukee. Woo-hoo! Woo-hoo! We win. We win. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm doing great. Great. Uh, some of our listeners either. probably know who you are, um, but many probably do not. Introduce yourself. Who, who is Aaron Spike? Well, my family, as, as Sally mentioned, my family and I make New Ulm our home. Um, for 11 years, I was a member of the IT department at Martin Luther College here in New Ulm, and just recently I have uh, moved on to, to something different. I'm working with the Genesis Institute in- Initiative and... Uh, we work with nonprofits to find different ways to make their their funding more sustainable. And uh, uh, as I said, I'm I'm married, and my wife and I have three kids. And today is our youngest's fifth birthday. Congratulations! It's uh-huh. awesome. In kindergarten, I assume. Uh, he's he's in preschool this year, and he'll be heading so to kindergarten. Take the next. requisite cupcakes. Uh, no, no cupcakes today. I think they're they have some organic granola bars. Actually. Ah, okay. Well, that works too. You got to be so careful these days. Can't have peanuts. You can't do the no. Right, MSG, right, no, right. And and no yeah, My son has has some of those problems. So that's okay. Yeah. If you have it. Uh, well, Aaron, thank you for joining us. And um, we asked you to join us for the 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 whole enchilada, so to speak, because we're talking about a topic and throughout the show we'll be referencing it, that uh, we probably should have talked about a long time ago. And uh, any of you webmasters out there will, will want to pay particular attention to our show this week because we're talking about a topic that doesn't, uh, you know, probably isn't top of mind, and unfortunately it should be, and that's web accessibility. How to build a website that is accessible uh, by those who maybe don't have all their fully functioning senses. So uh, they still would love to use the web and need to use the web, but we webmasters don't always make it easy on them, do we? That's right. Um, We uh, need to learn to be more sensitive to those who um, have particular challenges, for instance, uh, vision impaired or or whatever it may be, Um, even just reading disabilities. Um, I know a lot of schools are, are moving more toward um, online textbooks and things like that, but textbooks in general, online or not, um, if you have a reading disability, that that pr- provides a barrier to being able to access it. And so um, there are many things that you should be sensitive to um, for those that, that have these particular challenges. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't just need to be, uh, you know, we're not just talking about sight impairment, but... Uh, Aaron, you as a webmaster for many years for the MLC website, you would pay attention to even things like contrast and colors, use of colors for for those people who are colorblind. Sure, sure, that that is that is important, and and you're right, it is something that's very it's very easy to let slide because it's outside of our normal experience. Um, it's so easy for us 
to see what's on the screen and, and to hear what's going on in our video content and, and think that we've got it all taken care of. Um, but I think that even, even um, just a very small amount of attention to this can really open the door for more accessibility to your information. We had an unconference, Wells Tech unconference, uh, about a month ago, and this was actually one of the topics. And and yet, Aaron, you were very helpful in that session, bringing to light some things, some resources that maybe we should be paying attention to. So, if you're a webmaster out there and you want to be more in tune or attuned with uh, making your website more accessible, where where's a good place to start? Well, I think I think the place I like to start is not necessarily accessibility specific, but it, it's it's a way of looking at all of the different components of the web development picture. And let me just bring up let me just bring up an image here. Um, can you see that in front of you? It's, it's getting coming, there. I'm sure. There it is. Okay, we've got this is called the user experience honeycomb. And in the center you see what we're trying to achieve, which is we're trying to make our web presences valuable. And then around the edge, um, there are all of the components um, of, of value. We have that it's desirable. We have that the information is useful, that it's usable. We can actually do it. We can find the information that we need, and that the information is believable. And lastly, what we're talking about today, that the information is accessible. And I, th I think this diagram is very helpful for anyone having a web development discussion because many people have have, well, for lack of a more positive word right now, I'll just say agendas. Um, when we, we come to web development and we have things that we know need to get taken care of and they're in the forefront of our mind, and if we can pinpoint what we're talking about on this diagram and also pinpoint what other people are talking about on this diagram and see that maybe we're talking about different components, that's, I think that's a way to stop talking past each other and, and move toward a solution. Yeah, this is this is an awesome diagram. I've seen this in different formats and in, in, in different variations, but this really brings it all together. And there's probably not a um, you know webmaster out there who wouldn't look at this and say, "Yeah, that makes for a good user experience." So I think it's important to begin with to intentionalize that, and that's really what we're talking about: intentionalize each of the you know the areas of that honeycomb. If we're going to provide value, we need to do it in in a in a multi-dimensional way and to overlook one of them really diminishes is going to diminish the message and the effectiveness of the website and also then diminish the work that you're putting into it so it really is a stewardship issue and so as you're thinking about spending time with a website there are all these things and specifically now the one that we're talking about is that it's accessible um, and uh, so with that in mind so we're, if we're trying to make things accessible um, well, let's let's talk about what that means because I think yeah, at, exactly. At, What's the definition? Sally, you remember at the at the Wells Tech camp, I think we found that many of the people in the room weren't quite sure what accessibility meant. Right. That's um, true. Yeah. I think I think there's there's two ways to look at accessibility. There's a general way, and there's there's a very specific way um, that I, I think is is many times what we intend. But in a general way, um, accessibility is making information usable, available in different contexts. And so what does that mean? That, that means that we can look at a website on our browser, on our computer. It means we can see the information from that website on our phone, which is a very different form factor. It means that maybe that information is text-based and it's available to be read um, you know, in, an, in an audio stream, on a radio, where, wherever. Um, it, maybe that information is evil, even access, uh, accessible to our wristwatch in the future, you know, as our wristwatches get more, more intelligent and, and fancier. Mm -hmm. um, the, and your refrigerator and your microwave, any device, anywhere, all of these different contexts that you have access to that information. And I think, I think you'd agree that that, that is um, accessibility that matters for everyone, not just people who are affected by disabilities. But that, that specific idea of, of helping people with, with disabilities to access information and making sure that there's no barriers to their access, that's the more 
pointed definition of accessibility. If you think Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and then then we get into the 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 more technical guidelines, um, such as the government, the federal government has Section 508, and then there's the the web, the the W3C has the um, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. But I think those are really the two two kind of ways of looking at accessibility, the general and the very specific pointed accessibility for to make to remove barriers. My eyes were a little bit opened um, last spring when uh, a couple, Larry and Sue Povinelli, came in. Uh, they're part of our special ministries committee. And both of them are, one of them is uh, totally blind and one of them is, is partially blind. And they walked me through, they looked at wells.net and they looked at our Wells mobile app and they showed me how they need to interact with it. And they showed me both the things that we did right, purely by accident, and the things that we uh, we did wrong, which made it very difficult for them to to consume that content that we wanted everybody to consume. So that accessibility that we're talking about um, is, you know, may not be top of mind for us, but it hits them in the face, so to speak, every single day. And it's not all that hard to, I'm talking about websites now, it's not all that hard to improve that experience to a point where they are not having to fight with your website as opposed to enjoy the content and get good usefulness out of the content. So let's touch on some of those things. What what are some quick things, some easy things that you can do on your website that makes it more accessible? Well I think I think probably the quickest quickest thing to do and, and Sally just brought up the web content accessibility guidelines at a glance. I love this this page because it gives a very snappy, memorable. Well, maybe not maybe not snappy and memorable, but it's it's compact. <laughs> it's not it's, cool. it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's compact. It's a compact way of discussing accessibility. We have these four categories. Is it perceivable? Yeah, Is it per perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Right. So I think I think one of the the easiest things to do, right at the top there, uh, in the perceivable category, is text alternatives. Right. If you have an image on your website, and it is not a decorative image, if it's if it's transmitting information to to people who are sighted, I think you can add an alt uh, attribute to that image tag. Um, now this is being kind of technical. An alt attribute. Um, that that communicates the information that's encoded in that image um, to, and that that information is then usable to computers and and screen readers and and therefore accessible to people who can't see the image. Yep. Yeah, all tags are are kind of technical, but actually with today's um, WYSIWYG editors that are part of many content management systems, users are prompted as they're adding images to go ahead and include that alt tag. So it makes it pretty easy to include. It's actually more about forming the habit of doing it. You know, yeah. let's maybe yeah. make the motto, just do it, because um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's all about the habit, and um, if you do it consistently, um, you may not reap the benefits of it. You may not realize, you know, that those with vision impairments are actually gaining from the fact that those alt tags are there. But um, it does add value, and um, especially for those with those kind of impairments. Yeah, I think I think unfortunately it's one of those one of those items. If you're not being warned, where you know you leave some of those fields blank. Mm -hmm. um, so don't leave that field blank. Um, Unless you're supposed to, there there are times if it's a decorative image, please do leave it blank because then it's noise, it's it's noise for people who uh, you know it's 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 getting in their way uh, as as Martin was saying before. And, um, and maybe we should um, kind of explain a little bit and how it is noise because typically people with vision impairment use screen readers, and the screen reader. Um, reads to them in an audible way what it's encountering on the web page. And so if it encounters one of these alt tags, instead of saying <laughs> unknown image or something like that, it would actually read the alt tag so they would 
gain what people would be seeing from the image um, by hearing what was in that image location. But right. if it encounters... A, a but if it, if it says image, horizontal rule, footer, yeah. or image, image one, dot jpg, that's not helpful. That's, that's not communicating information. So you need, you need appropriate text in those places, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and keep in mind that it, you know, it, semantically speaking, um, it is going to read um, in a linear fashion. So as you put together your website, you need to understand how that screen reader is going to actually read the page. Um, so organization is also important. The menuing structure yeah, and so forth. I I think that it is a a very useful exercise for any any web developer, webmaster, to sit down one day, and it will be a frustrating experience, I promise you, but to sit down one day and, and try to navigate a website um, using a screen reader and your keyboard and, and listen to, um, to the noise and, and the linear reading of your web page. And, and you might cry a little bit, um, <laughs> but, but it'll be worthwhile because it's, it's an, it's an eye-opening experience. Yeah. And along and those lines, we probably should mention that we'll have a link in the show notes to Wave. Maybe you guys want to explain what Wave is. Wave Wave is a, an accessibility auditing tool. Um, some some of accessibility um, ideas and needs can be audited automatically on the computer. They can go through and test that every image automatically has uh, an alt tag. Um, there are some things that really need human interaction to decide, but you can go a long way um, running one of these automatic um, auditing tools on your website and see what what are things, where are things that I could improve on my website, and do a little bit, improve a little bit each time. Every time it gets better. Um, I don't think I don't think any little bit is too little. And it does show you the text. Um, it doesn't necessarily read it to you the way screen reading software would, but um, it will show you what text and what order the text would be read on your page. Sure. Yep. Yep. It will, because it linearizes the content. You can use a tool like that oftentimes to remove the style sheets. Um, I hope to have a chance to talk about that later too. Um, there is actually a tool out there that will interpolate the the type of words that screen readers use in a textual fashion. It's called the FANG screen reader emulator. Uh, and that's that's a tool for Firefox that will, you know, say heading level one and then read your headings for you and read your page the way or it will type out the text the way a screen reader would read it. So you can you can experience that if you don't have a screen reader. Okay. The um Another thing that you can do, and we can all do this, and this serves a couple of different purposes. Um, if you have a mobile device, and I'll speak specifically of iOS since uh, it seems to be in the news these days. A new version of iOS just came out, and they may be introducing some, some new goodies today in a press conference. But if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, uh, there is a feature... Uh, under your settings, under general accessibility, that you can turn on um, voiceover and other different things that will um, uh, allow you to experience what, let's say, somebody who would actually need those tools, uh, what what their experience would be. Uh, not just seeing maybe your website in a mobile format, which is maybe revealing in and of itself. Uh, because that is a form of accessibility. Can it be read? Can is is it usable from it's a different a, context from a mobile platform, right? Uh, but then also just uh, experience what the the typical you know sight impaired person might experience with that accessibility setting turned on, and you'll I think you'll quickly realize the same thing as a screen reader, you know, on a website that. Um, well, we have to make this easier than it is. And uh, so just to give you an appreciation for it, if nothing else, and then uh, put that as part of your testing process. I think busy webmasters, and I know a lot of our listeners and viewers are not full-time webmasters. You know, they're volunteers. They, they do the best they can for their church or school. 
and they don't have a lot of time for this, but there should be a, uh, a built-in workflow where testing is a part of what you do, and this should be a part of your testing. Open it up in a, on a tablet, in a mobile browser, see how accessible it is, run it through Wave or some of these sites, uh, and uh, take a look at the results and make some small changes that would make some small improvements to it, and then before you know it, you've gone through uh, what you're putting up, but it becomes a part of what you do, and uh, I think you'll you'll benefit, and your your viewers will benefit as well. Yep, um, it's all about understanding it from their perspective. It's just kind of overwhelming to think of how many different perspectives you need to understand it from. But yeah, um, kind of walking a mile in their shoes would would really lead you to be motivated to to go that extra. That yep. extra alt tag on their behalf. Huh? Yep. So there's there, we could talk you know forever on this topic, and we'll probably revisit this uh, again in the future. But uh, for now, uh, please go to the show notes page, and uh, there are a number of resources that we will place there, including the notes. I think we're going to put uh, a link to maybe the notes from our Wells Tech camp. Uh, experience there and then the resources that we've been talking about so if this is something that you want to get involved with and pay a little bit more attention to there's no shortage of resources so if you want to get smart on this topic there's no excuse you have the, the resources there so please take a look at those let's move along um, I'm kind of excited about this next segment Sally in, in under ministry resources a cool new tool out there from Concordia yeah, I received an email from Concordia Publishing House this week. You probably did too. Anybody that's um, ever bought from them or whatever maybe received the same email. But it's to their new um, small catechism uh, in mobile format. So speaking of accessibility, they've taken the small catechism published from Concordia, I think, um, in the 80s, and uh, turned it mobile. You can see it just by browsing to, I think it's um, cph.org slash catechism, and it'll resolve to this website. Um, it's very um, clean, easy to read, great fonts, typography included, and uh, looks fantastic on a tablet. I, I looked at it on my web page and you know that's great, it looks really nice, but when I brought it up on the iPad um, I was just really impressed with um, the typography especially and the amount of white space that they built into it. So um, it's just straightforward Luther's Catechism, but um, optimized for mobile devices. So Yeah, they've done a nice job with this and this is a, a resource that you can now have in your pocket or on your mm -hmm. tablet wherever you go. So it's a, uh, they say that there's an iOS and an Android app to follow but to be honest I'm sure it's just essentially the same thing as we're seeing here and there, there's really no reason, no reason to, to not jump right in and start to use it especially those of you that teach catechism class or are catechism students uh, probably a resource that you want to want to take advantage of. Right, and this is one that they can use your recent tip on, Martin, because when you're on your device, it'll even prompt you to add an icon to your home screen. Right. So browse to it in your browser, but then add the icon on your home screen, and then the next time you launch, it'll launch in a full screen mode. And I'm telling you, you want to get this. It's a really beautiful presentation of the catechism. Yep, probably long overdue, so they did a nice job. Very good. All right, Ministry Resources, we are looking for you, our listeners and viewers, to submit uh, Ministry Resources as well. And if you do, and if it's something that we use on the show, you'll be entered in to our drawing that will end, what did we say, May 30th, May 31st, Sally? Yeah, that's right. Um, so if you do it by then and we use it, uh, you may have a chance to win an Apple TV. Um, so what we're looking for are technology tools that serve ministry purposes. So like, like this, uh, this mobile catechism is a perfect example of a ministry resource. If you're, if you're wondering about others that we've had on the show, we have a list of those on the website so that uh, there's no duplication. But if you've got something that you found that's very useful in your ministry, and that you want to share, please do that. Wellstech at wells.net is our email address. Or just go to the show notes page and uh, use one of the tools there to, to let us know about a ministry resource. Aaron, you're going to have to think of one. I know you would love to have an Apple TV. 
<laughs> Aaron doesn't strike me as an Apple guy. Are you an Apple guy, Aaron? You know, actually, I I am a, a recent Mac convert. One of my really? one of my one of my former. Um, I'm a Linux guy at heart, but every that's, day that's at work, what I was pegging you as. I figured you had a tricked out uh, PC with Linux running on it, and you had the uh, the Firefox phone and all that jazz. I, I, well, I don't have a Firefox phone, but I I have I have a Linux box sitting in front of me. But right next to it, I have a MacBook Air. Okay. And uh, you can thank you can thank Bob Martins at MLC for that. <laughs> um, but I I was thinking before I wonder when you were talking about voiceover on the. On the mobile devices, I thought. I wonder if there's any other Windows to Mac converts out there that have hit Command F5 and discovered VoiceOver, Accidentally. and been very, been very, very alarmed, <laughs> um, as I was one day. You can do that on Windows now, real easily. Um, yeah, I've done it at least twice, <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's telling me, uh, and you can't just t tell it to stop. I mean, yeah, you, you don't know how. You don't that'd be know. yeah, that would be too intuitive. Um, you know, it's not like Siri or uh, Google now, but uh, <laughs> that's funny. Okay, let's move on to our next segment, which is our tip of the week, and I'll go first. Uh, my tip of the week is uh, a little trick that I found kind of by accident, and uh, now it's probably pretty mainstream, and many, many of you probably know how to do this, but I'll share it for everybody. And that's if you are a Microsoft Word user, and I know a lot of you are, for better or for worse, uh, back in 07, Microsoft introduced this thing called the Ribbon. Uh, so let me do a quick screen share of, uh, if I can get the right screen up. Um, so I'm showing you uh, Microsoft Word. In 07, they introduced this ribbon, which has all kinds of one-click commands. And I think, in general, I like the user interface. I think it's helpful. I think they've done a nice job with it. The only thing that is somewhat annoying at times, other than if you can't find exactly what you're looking for because you got everything but the kitchen sink here, is the fact that it takes up a lot of screen real estate. Um, so you have this big old thing at the top that you can't... Um, Know, that you seemingly have to work around, so it uh, encringes on your screen real estate and the, the, the text that you want to write or the document that you want to work on. Uh, but never fear, there's a fairly easy way to collapse that ribbon, and that's simply by clicking, double-clicking on any tab. So if I wanted to uh, collapse the ribbon here, I would just double-click on a tab, and away it goes. Uh, and to bring it back, so now I just have the tab items at the top without the tab contents. But if I wanted to get at the tab contents, I would simply click on the item that I want, and that tab would then appear. And then if I click away, it um, collapses back into uh, just that single line of text. So uh, you can keep it in this mode just by a single click now. We'll open and close it on command and then it goes away. Or if you want to keep it open permanently like it comes installed, you can double click on that tab again and it will stay open. I'm on uh, Office 2013 here, or Windows 20, or uh, Microsoft Word 2013, and I don't know if this is in 2010, but there's also a little carrot here on the right that will collapse the ribbon. Control F1 is the keyboard command if you're uh, if you want to use a keyboard shortcut which will take it away as well and do essentially the same thing. So just a little quick tip but it will be a little bit of a time saver and uh, improve the experience if you just don't need that ribbon in your face all the time and you just want to just want to see the piece of paper that you're typing on. I'm smiling, Martin, because I can't tell you how many people I've helped with that. So that's a great tip. I bet there are people that are appreciating that right now because I've gotten support calls on, oh, no, my commands all went away, you know, and uh, people kind of freaked out over that. So yep. Yep. that's a good one. All right. Uh, Sally, you have a tip? My turn, and my tip is Chrome browser specific. So I'm going to do a, a quick screen share of my Chrome browser to uh, point you to the way to control your Chrome extensions. Um, I had to learn some good terminology when I went to Google Summit this summer. There are apps, um, Google Apps, which are basically 
um, specialized links to websites. Um, so apps um, aren't what I'm covering here. I'm covering extensions, and those are the little icons that are part of your Chrome browser that allow you to do certain functions on a web page. For instance, um, if I used my PicMonkey icon here, I could take a screenshot of this web page, and it would open it up right away in PicMonkey for me to Sally, edit. Sally, I think you get PicMonkey in almost every third show, maybe, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and I smile this big monkey grin. I'm very right. cheeky about PicMonkey, yes. So that's just one of my favorite apps. Yep. Uh, apps, Extension. not apps, extensions yep. that's sitting here in my browser, but sometimes uh, the extensions can kind of weigh me down and I may turn off extensions that I thought were really cool but I don't really have a use for. Um, so I wanted to point you to this last icon um, on the far right and that's how you can customize your Chrome experience. It brings up the, the control menu of your Chrome browser and buried under tools is a link to the extension manager. And so if you go to that, and you can also type Chrome uh, colon extensions, and you'll land on the same page. Um, but if you go here, you can see the extensions you've installed, and you can see that some are enabled and some are disabled. So perhaps at this point, I'd like to enable the Google URL shortener. I installed it at some point, but then I decided to disable it. So it's easy to just um, check and re-enable, and then that um, icon is activated in your extension list um, in your browser. So again, you may want to... Um, you may want to control things here. When I went to Google Summit, I asked everybody, what extensions do you use the most? And I installed everything I could, you know, glean from people as being great extensions. And I'm sure all of these are really are great extensions. Um, but then at some point I thought, no, i got to turn all this stuff off. It's loading me down just a little too much. Um, so here I can go back and see what extensions and control them just with the click of a, a button um, to turn them on and off. Again, under the Google Chrome uh, tool uh, menu, you'll find the link to extensions. That's my tip of the week. Cool. You know that icon amongst developers at least has a name? Oh, it does. Good. Tell me what it is. Do you, do you know what it is, Aaron? I have no idea, but I've always wondered. The three <laughs> bars. They call it a hamburger. Really? Yeah. That's a hamburger icon. That. I always called it the last place I would look for a useful menu. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, that too. Yes, absolutely. But uh, and uh, you know, another bonus tip: you can rearrange those um, extensions as well. So you can drag them to different places. So if there's some that you, you use more often, and Sally, you have the one in the left most place, the 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 most prominent seat, the same one that I do, and that's my last pass icon. But you can move those around to your to your heart's content. Just click and drag. Good to know. All right, Aaron, do you have a tip for us? Well, I, I would like to, to show you something that I think is useful, sort of get your mind thinking about accessibility. And I'm just going to awesome. switch screens here. Here's This is a Firefox browser. Um, and this is, this is something, I guess, Firefox specific. But um, can you see that now? Well, I can see in, it in the little window. I'm not seeing it there in the it is. big. Okay. At, in the Firefox menus, there is the view menu. And in the view menu, there is, is one category, page style. And you can choose no style, which takes away a lot of the, the visual aspects of your web page and just does vanilla styling. And then, then things uh, start to pop out with regard to accessibility. You can see what information is contained in your images. Um, real easily because it's very noticeable. You can see whether the organization of your page follows um, a sensical linear path through the information on the page. I think this is a, a useful thing to try every once in a while just to see see what's on your page without without the the visual noise uh, or you know visual beauty um, that you've crafted for your your site. Mm -hmm. And then don't forget to turn it back off. <laughs> I bet I wouldn't forget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But that is the makeup of your page. That's what it is. For CSS gets a hold of it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, All Firefox right. used to have the ability to turn off images too, which is kind of useful. But they, I think, they took that away in in recent versions. I think it's probably the same, the sort of the same thing that Sally was talking about with the ribbon that people get there and don't know how to get back, and yeah. it's it can be disturbing. Yeah. yeah, if you're a webmaster, you probably want to at least in some way get familiar with the developer tools that are available within your particular browser. All of them have them. Sometimes you have to install them. And sometimes they can give you information about um, different things about your website, even uh, page load times and um, you know, those kinds of things allow you to turn scripts off and see, uh, you know, see different things a little bit behind the scenes. So, And there are all kinds of tutorials out there. Maybe we would have a show on that at some point in the future, too. All right, let's move along to our next segment, and that is our picks of the week. And Aaron, I'm going to let you uh, continue on as our as our honored guest. You have a pick this week. Okay. Well, talking about accessibility again, one of the things that I find um, kind of kind of difficult to to understand with regard to accessibility is in order for people to be able to easily see the information on your pages, you need to have a certain amount of contrast between foreground and background colors. Right. Um, And, uh, you know, I've read the accessibility guidelines, and that calculation isn't easy to do. The the, the math, well, let's just say I didn't understand it immediately. I don't think that it's higher than a high school level level math, but the description is kind of (laughs) thick. Um, But there are are tools online, um, and and here's one. It's called Contrast Ratio. and it's it's a site that allows you to specify two colors, a, a text color and a background color. And it takes any kind of format that you'd use in web design and CSS. And here, 21 is the the maximum ratio, which would be white on black or black on white, I assume. Right. Yeah. Yep. And you can switch the background with this button here, and it'll tell you that it passes. Triple A level for any size text. That's the highest. But let's so maybe try. It's kind of like blackjack. You want twenty-one. You well, yeah, you do want okay. you. Well, you want. Let's let's just look at that. The the highest level um, is achieved when you have. Um, let me put another five there. This is two point eight. But if we go to six, oh, I should be on white here. There. That, if if you have if you go from six to five you can achieve the fi- highest level. Triple A is the highest level. Um, five is... What you're doing is putting in uh, color I'm, I'm codes checking either different, white yeah, or different, code. different levels of gray right. to see how they, how they contrast with, with my background color, which is white. One thing I like about this page is it's very clean, and uh, it lets you really get a, a taste of what your text looks like on the left. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's a good uh, something you can easily play with and get a sense for um, uh, what how it, how it looks, but then also how access quote unquote accessible it is too. Because there are right. yeah, that's one complaint we we get quite a bit. Two two complaints we get uh, for our Wells.net site over time, and we've made some tweaks to it over time as well. Is the color you know the the contrast ratio, but then also the size of the text, and there are uh, guidelines for that as well in some of the documents that we put out there to um, what uh, what's acceptable and what's not so Sally my turn and my pick is going to be a Chrome extension believe it or not following that accessibility theme uh, the Chrome extension I wanted to share was one I learned at Google Summit this summer it's called Announceify and Announceify basically will read the web to you um, in kind of the same fashion we've been discussing um, what a screen reader would read or whatever. So it's a little plug-in. It looks like a little red bird. I have it installed um, as an extension in my Chrome browser. So when I go to a particular web page, like the Wells Tech site, I can click the little birdie and a new window opens. It processes the web page for a few moments and then it begins reading the text to me and it'll display the text only version Um, here in the screen. Hopefully it won't take too long to show you this example. I doubt you'll hear it reading uh, with the way the sound is set up, but but it does begin reading the text to you. I think you can choose between a couple of voices. I can hear it a little bit. 
So it blurs out that the next paragraph. It does. So you can focus on um, the paragraph that it's reading. Yep. Interesting. Well, so, I even, I think that would be a useful useful tool just for everyday reading to not be distracted while you read on the web. Right. Definitely. So, um, yeah, uh, we talked a lot about teachers that have um, students with reading disabilities um, using it for for classroom use on a Chromebook. Um, so lots of different applications there. Uh, free extension plugin for the Chrome browser. It's called Announceify. Cool. All right. Uh, my pick is. Let me get the right. Uh, window here. I'm going to get a little uh, inception action there. Uh, my pick of the week is something called Flipboard. Um, Flipboard has been around for a number of years and uh, it's it's now on all major mobile platforms. It's a um, it's a visual tool to read content on your devices and uh, it takes content from let's say your social networks uh, it takes content from curated collections of online magazines so Martin we're still seeing the vortex thing really yeah whoa <laughs> let, me, uh, let me correct that here sorry about that didn't mean to interrupt but no don't want to miss out on that good stuff you're sharing with us. How's that? That looks much better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Flipboard.com, by the way, is the website, but uh, basically it's a uh, an app that you would install on your Android or, or iOS device. It's also on uh, Windows uh, Windows tablets as well. But as I said, it's uh, it's a a very visually rich experience when you. You know, plug this app uh, into your phone and then this and subscribe to different curated pieces of content or your Facebook or Twitter accounts and it brings it together in a uh, in a way where you you select which board you want to read and then you basically flip through it um, so they have all kinds of magazines you can subscribe to uh, as I mentioned, Facebook. So if you subscribe to your, fa if you plug in your Facebook credentials, it'll go through your Facebook friends or their posts on your timeline. And wherever there's an article listed or an image that they share, uh, it does a beautiful job of bringing this into the app so that you can read it more in a magazine style format. You'll still see their text, but you'll see you know, maybe some of the articles that they've linked to or other websites that they've linked to, and you can explore uh, that content in, a, in kind of a magazine style format. Um, Flipboard's come a long ways where they, it used to be just Twitter, where you had to subscribe to Twitter lists or Twitter accounts and you'd see just what they were tweeting about and the links that they were sharing and the images that they were sharing. Now there's this whole ecosystem of Flipboard content, subscriptions to collections of magazines, and you can even subscribe to uh, curated content from other readers that they put together their own content from across the web that you can enjoy. Um, it's just the way I prefer now to consume uh, the news of the day. You can uh, you can get different kinds of built-in subscriptions. Maybe it's uh, local news or U.S. news or world news. It can be around topics like photography or gaming or music or, or DIY projects. Um, just a, a lot of different uh, options as you're using this. And it's totally free, so there's no cost to it. Um, and I haven't found any better news reader. So those of us that were kind of lamenting the whole uh, Google Reader demise, this is kind of a substitute for me where most of the content I found there is available in a subscription format here uh, in, a, in a very visual way. You can go in there, you can, you can um, share content, you can add individual magazines to your own collection, uh, you can organize it, um, and uh, just kind of a neat experience and there, there really isn't a very good in my opinion competitor to this 
Um, there have been a, a few that have tried, but this is really the, the top of the heap. That's Flipboard. Okay, so I was thinking about a couple of things. One was competitiveness, <laughs> but not in what you just said. Um, more like, how is it that you always get really good picks? And I use Flipboard all the time, and why did you I never, never think thought of, of it? <laughs> not that we're competitive or anything, but yeah. Uh, the other thing I was thinking of was you said. Um, that's pretty much your your news reader. Your and uh, I was just visualizing my dad, who back in the day woke up every morning at 5 a.m. and went and got his morning paper off the driveway and sat in the kitchen and read his morning paper. And I um, I turn on my Flipboard and read the morning news from my Flipboard. So I'm. What's nice about it is you could you could navigate to a lot of these websites and through other RSS readers, but then you're going to go to their website and then you got to do the scroll and the double tap to bring this you know the text up to the right size so you can actually read it. What Flipboard does is it brings that content in in nice big text. We're speaking of accessibility, nice big text that you can read it, and if you want to dig deeper, you can click on it and it uh, continues to show you you know, that content in a very readable, easy to consume way. That's what I really like about it. Be because that information was made available for multiple contexts. That's right. So that's yep, great. they thought about that and uh, that's really their their game at this point. So, good deal. All right, let's move along to our community feedback. And we have a good amount of community feedback to share today. Um, just hoping that my screen is sharing correctly. It looks like it yep. is. All right. Um, so first up were some links shared via Digo uh, from our friend Jason Schmidt out in Omaha, Nebraska. He shared Activities. It's the application of apps. And um, looks like it's organized by grade level. So this is kind of an education site uh, related to different apps. And you can come here and, and learn about them and see applications of them for the classroom. Activities.org. Um, he also shared a link to QCraft. Um, and there's a wiki page about installing it on your Minecraft EDU. Don't know how many of our listeners are doing Minecraft in the classroom, but I know Jason uh, ran a summer camp for kids using Minecraft and um, you know, tying in educational activities. This QCraft actually demonstrates quantum physics in Minecraft. Um, boy, I'd love to see it demonstrated. Uh, it looks like you can learn more here on the QCraft wiki. So we'll have a link in our show notes and uh, you can learn more about quantum physics in Minecraft. All right. Uh, next we had and a link. Minecraft, Minecraft is kind of like Pick Monkey too for Sally. <laughs> <laughs> for Sally's kids, it comes for sure. Up pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah. But it's surprising. There's the uses that we're finding for Minecraft. Imagine uh, that. It, it's an amazing thing. Yep. You have to try it one of these days. Our friend Ryan Rosenthal, who's at Faith in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, um, shared a link to. Uh, notes, follow-up notes from a UW Oshkosh Google and Intel Summit. So if you want to um, check out what was discussed at UW Oshkosh's event, um, here's the link. Um, you can check it out on your Google Drive. And then a few links that I shared via Digo. One is to freewebpageheaders.com um, where you can download um, nice quality images, all sized 800 by 200, and they are free of charge, licensed under Creative Commons, so they're just asking for attribution. They allow you to remix the images or whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. And there's um, probably 70 or 80 of them here. If you check out their gallery, um, you can see just pages and pages of free web page headers. Um, you just click on the one that you like, and it comes up, and you can save it to your computer and make use of it. So Nice resource for our final web users, because a lot of those templates have that, um, that same kind of format across the top for, mm -hmm. their, uh, for their, their banners. Definitely. You may have to do a little resizing, but uh, you've got a good start there. Yep. Here's a Chrome extension you may want to take care of that allows you to customize the new Google App Launcher. So Martin, you showed us that we could rearrange um, the different uh, extensions you have displayed in your Chrome bar up here. But this is the App Launcher. Let's see if I have my Google account open. Maybe in my drive would see it. Nope. 
I still have the old version. See, I don't get that. I mean, you go to some pages and it's there, and other pages and it's not. Okay. Uh, there it is. Yeah, so here I'm logged into a different account in this window, and here's the app launcher. The black bar um, is gone that used to have your links to your calendar and things, and now um, you have this, and you can click more to see more of them, but apparently with this particular extension that I'm going to include a link to in the show notes, you can reorganize the order of the display of those apps. So it's an app launcher customizer for Google. Why Google didn't put that in there in the first place? Didn't they think people might want to arrange those a little bit differently? They have the power. Yeah. Um, one more link. This is for our social studies teachers that are listening, and it's called Constitute, constituteproject.org, and it basically has the world's constitutions to read, search, and compare. So you can bring up a list of countries and then look at different um, constitutions. You can search for a particular country, uh, or the date that it was written and find the different constitutions. The print is really light, but there's the United States Constitution and when you click on it, hopefully it's going to load. I think it's loading. You have to hit apply. Oh. Okay. And there's a link to it. it. has the date, the revision dates, and the Constitution comes up for display. So um, Easy cut and paste there, too, for projects. Definitely. So I think a, a good link to share with your social studies classrooms. And finally, we had an email from our friend Rob Gunther, uh, pastor at Grace in Kenai, Alaska. He shared a couple of links. One, an interesting article from Christianity Today um, about church stereotypes according to Google. And basically what they are suggesting is that you can figure out what people are searching on in regards to your church denomination by um, beginning a search with uh, YR and maybe your church denomination. And then because Google fills in the most popular searches as you're typing, um, you may see some of the things that people think about your church denomination. Um, you know, interesting. I'm not sure if it's super scientific or anything, but you could at least get a, a feel for what people think of different denominations by what they're searching in Google. That's interesting. Google is, you know, we think of Google as this big company that provides us some cool tools, but really the power of Google is the information they have and their search engine yet, and this is just another product of, of what they know about us <laughs> or... Um, society in general just from how we use it and they're putting it together in, in interesting ways and this is an example. Yep. And then finally a link, another link from Pastor Gunther to uberconference.com another um, free web conferencing tool. I don't think this one has video included. It shows a little image of the person in the phone call. Um, but it's free and easy to do and you can have conference calls using your computer as your telephone. And, uh, you know, I can see some application for this, free conference calling, um, you know, not requiring people necessarily to, to do a lot to get access to it. it it's all about uh, getting people in the same place at the same time, and this is another option for you, kind of parallel to Skype and Google Hangouts somewhat. Cool. Uber conference. Yep. Very good. That it for community feedback? That's all I got for you today, Martin. Sally, how do the kids in the class share with everybody else? <laughs> well, we have lots of ways on our Wells Tech website. Too bad I just stopped my screen share, but I can start it again. Wellstech.wells.net is the website. Um, and you can find all these fun links. Look, there's even one for Pinterest. So if you want to share with us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Digo, Pinterest, um, even our Wells Tech Wiki, uh, the links are all there. There's links for finding us in iTunes and on Stitcher Radio um, and for emailing us. You can even send us a voicemail with the link that's provided in the right-hand column. So we'd love to hear your voice and play it on the show. Very good. Thanks. And thanks to everybody who contributes. Next week, Sally, kind of a special show. You're going to be not in New Ulm, but right here in, uh, I said Milwaukee before. It's actually technically Waukesha. Uh, Wisconsin, and uh, we're going to have a little face-to-face -face Wells Tech 
like we did this past summer, and the topic du jour is uh, travel related. We've done this before. What's in your bag? So we're going to take a look at what we what we pack in our backpacks or uh, or uh, technology uh, bag of choice, and uh, what we feel is important to take on the road. So tune in next week for that. That's always a fun show. We have all kinds of little doohickeys and gadgets and things like that that we uh, find indispensable when we're out on the road. Yeah, I don't get away too often, but you're definitely our seasoned traveler and uh, having made it to Hong Kong a few times in the last year or two. and So I'm curious what you carry with you. And there's always something I forget. So we'll talk about that too. <laughs> what's in your bag? What What's not in your bag? Not right. really what did you forget <laughs> this time, dummy? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, as we mentioned last week and as we started last week, we're giving a free down, a song download each week. And this song uh, download, this free download this week is from Michael Armstrong. And go to the show notes page to, to read more about Michael and his website. But his song Made in the Image is what we're going to be making available for one week. You have to go to the show notes page to find that link and download it. A number of people took advantage of last week's song from Michael Wessendorf. This is another Michael, Michael Armstrong, made it in, in the image. Aaron Spike, thank you for taking thank the you. time with us today. Really enjoyed your insights, and we're going to have to thank have you Thank you very much for having again. me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, blessings on your work in your uh, in the second in next chapter of, of your career there in New Ulm. And uh, don't be a stranger. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank all of our viewers and listeners for joining us. Tune in next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. <music>